Hey everyone, welcome to this live session on how to find research positions as an IMG. Um, I am waiting for everyone to come on. It looks like, um, yeah, some people are coming on already. Welcome, 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 welcome guys. Welcome to this live session. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm going to add Dr. Kuli Khan so that she can join me because we're going to do this together. So just drop in the chat. Tell me where you're dialing, where you're joining in from. I'd like to know where you are currently, and also let me know what phase in the IMG journey that you're on. Like, are you, you know, a third year student at Caribbean? Are you a physician in another country? Are you in the states and doing rotations, observerships? I kind of want to know a little bit about you. All right, we have Boston, Massachusetts. We have Connecticut in the house. Hey guys, hello, hello, hello. Welcome, welcome, hi. welcome. Joining from Virginia, joining from India. Hi, 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 Wafa, how are you? Hi, Dr. Lum, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Your, your sound is really great. I should oh, wear okay. my headphones still, but actually, let me get my AirPods on. Okay. I think it's gonna make it even better. My AirPods get lost in my scarf and I always worry about them falling out, so I'm like, I'm just yeah. going to stick to the old stuff. <laughs> You're going to stick to that one. Yeah, that makes sense. Let's see if it's going to connect. I think I'm connected. Okay, great. So my sounds, yeah, that's going to be better now. Hi, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. All right. I, I can see. So we have tons of people joining. I mean, from everywhere. We'll just give it a few yeah. minutes mm -hmm. and then we'll head right into it. But let's just, let's just, let's talk for a little bit. So I'm hoping everybody that's joining has listened to your episode because then you gave your introductions. But mm -hmm. you know, everyone that's on this call, I'm going to introduce myself and then I'll let you introduce yourself and we'll just hop right into some conversation. So I'm Nina Loom. I'm family medicine trained. I'm a hospitalist. I work in Kentucky. I also spend a lot of time encouraging, empowering IMGs um, through their pathway. I do that with podcasting with my blog, DrDinaLoom.com and the IMG Roadmap Podcast. So I had Dr. Kulikan on the podcast uh, last week, and we had tons of questions regarding research. And so we decided to come together and do this live session so we could address those questions live, particularly guiding people on how to find research positions. Um, Dr. Kulikan, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself for those who maybe haven't listened to your episode so that they can uh, kind of learn a little bit about you? Hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Wafa Kulikan, and I'm tuning in from Houston. Of all Yay. places. Uh, uh, <laughs> I work as a clinical research coordinator in pediatric neurology, and I just stumbled into research without meaning to, and I have been introduced to this world of research. And what I mainly do is that I conduct cl clinical trials for um, different patients, depending on what kind of treatments they need or trying to check like for the drugs itself, like try to see the efficacy and if they actually work for our patient demographic or not. So while working in this, I actually started noticing that as an MD that there were a lot of places where if people choose to be in research, they can go down that lane as well. But there were tons of opportunities for us MDs to get in and really like amp up our CVs when it comes to applications and kind of work within a niche that's just basically hidden from a lot of us. And I really didn't really find much information when I was Googling. So I just thought if I can share my perspective with people and maybe if they can get some useful information, why not? Right. Absolutely. And I love that yeah. you did because it sparked, you know, a whole world of conversation around this topic. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the key things that I want to share with everyone. So you, you are a graduate from a medical school in China, right? Yes. <laughs> but you're from Saudi. So you have yes. a very diverse background. I yes. like to point that out because I want people watching to also relate with the fact that you're doing this while you're in the process of working on your, your portfolio, really, mm -hmm. towards yeah. your future residency application. And so one of the big questions that people was asking me is like, how do I get research? How do I get research? But before we even hop into it, because I want you to share a little bit about how you got research and how other people can seek out those positions. I just want to touch on one thing. When it comes to the U.S. residency pathway, mm -hmm. and there, it's, it's specialty specific. So there are some specialties such as like, the surgical specialties that really honor um, publications and maybe clinical mm -hmm. research, okay? 
there are other specialties that are also interested in scholarly activity, but yes. you don't have to have had a publication in a major reputable journal, for example. Um, and there are different tiers to research when it comes to residency application. Mm -hmm. With that, you can do as a student, you can participate in a case series, a case report, cross-sectional study. Um, you know, uh, I, I'm just banking out on just different types of research that mm -hmm. are available. You can do all of those and those still count to your interest in the specialty because the research project that you participate in is really a way to tell your pioneers in your specialty or the leaders in your specialty that you have a sense of interest in advancing the specialty because that's what research is. Research Absolutely. is about answering a clinical question, bringing a solution to clinicians who are on the floor seeing patients, bringing a solution that changes the health of the population. So when you look at it that way, you can report a case, uh, you can write a case report about a, a, something you saw on the wards and that will carry a lot of weight, okay? Especially if you end up presenting that at a conference. You can participate in a cross-sectional survey and have your, your findings uh, written out with the guidance of a preceptor and that will count as research. You can be in a randomized control clinical trial Right, which mm -hmm. I'm, I'm assuming yeah. you tell us some about that too, mm -hmm. and and that is like the big brother of all research, but you don't always have to have all of that to be no. a competitive applicant for for residency applications. So I just want us to kind of lay that kind of groundwork. Mm -hmm. But tell us about how you found your position and how you think IMGs can go about finding positions, especially someone that's as diverse as you. You know, having a background in two different countries. And then here in the States practicing, uh, yeah. I, I should say, you know, participating in clinical research. Yeah. So I'm so glad that you kind of laid that out there because I got bombarded by questions and I was like, uh, I'm not a pro at this, <laughs> but yeah. I tried to answer as many questions as possible. And I'm glad we did the live session because I think coming from a different background, like research in Saudi Arabia, research in China, research in Pakistan, India, Nepal, like all of the countries is different. Everyone associates research as publishing a paper. As simply put, but what people need to just be more aware of is that there's medicine and research as itself is an entity. And then within those, there are tons of ways that you can pick and choose whatever applies to you, your specialty, your personality, whatever highlights your strengths and weaknesses. For me, yes, I had definitive, I think instead of being worried about, uh, I come from way too many countries or I've been traveling around, I was afraid that a lot of the programs might think that I am not serious enough, that I change my mind quite often. And I think when you come to a new country like United States, you get bombarded with all of this information. You're just not sure where to go and where to make sense of what. And that's pretty much where I was starting from. And I started like four years ago and I was a complete loss because we also have to take into consideration that these are shoes. I don't have the money for it. Uh, we're also working through the whole process of getting our degrees approved and all of that. So if we put all of that aside, the first thing I did was print out your CV, make tons of copies of it. I just put it in my car and put on my GPS 15 miles around all the private doctors that were working near me. And it didn't matter what specialty they were doing. It was just about getting the foot in the door. So I just would go around and then I spotted a place. I'll take a CV, I'll walk in, drop it off at the reception. So I think by the fourth one that I went and dropped off, I just told them like, do you have a position? Do you have an observership? Do you have anything that I can help with? And then the doctor was just get, finishing up with one of the patients. She's like, come in. And I walked in gave my introduction and she was like, okay, you can start on Monday as an observer. So that's where I started. And then when I told her about a little bit about my journey, where I'm coming from, what are my goals? She was like, oh, have you tried research? Oh, maybe if you talk to this person. So a lot of the doctors are very open to helping, but you just need to present yourself in front of them so they can recognize, okay, this is a person that I can help. It's very hard that you send an email. It's not visual, if you get what I mean. It's If I'm not there in front of you, it's very hard for them to be like, there was this person who emailed me back in January. Let me connect that person. Very few of us can do that because doctors are working every day. They're seeing like tons of patients every day. They have tons of activities. So it's not on their forefront to make sure that they pick and choose and match students. It's not part of their job. 
So you have to make sure that you present yourself in front of people and let them know about your goals, about what you want to do. And whether yeah. that's research or anything, it's just about don't be afraid that if I'm not getting my door in the research, then I can't do anything. If I'm not getting through it, find ways that you can get in. Um, a lot of the students actually aim for going for the big names and big universities. Plain and simple, they're like, oh, I'm going to go to University of this. I'm going to go to UCLA. I'm going to go to Harvard. I'm going to go to Yale. Very good. But in order to get there, you have to start somewhere because they're also yeah. looking for exceptional people. They have tons of applications coming in. So they want to make sure that the people that they choose to be a part of their community knows what they're doing and would be able to match up with their needs as well. So if you are aiming for Harvard and Yale, yes, aim high, absolutely. But also try to take advantage of the community you're coming from and what resources you have and kind of build over there. Don't all immediately just assume Harvard, why didn't I get it? My heart is crushed. You have to just build it up with your experience and that's how you get to that point. So I'm, mm. I'm just glad you touched on that and that's what I did. I got into observership. I told the, the doctor about my intentions. She pointed me out to a private research facility and it was owned by a group of doctors that were conducting research for cardiology. And I went over there and because they didn't have a lot of people, uh, they just were like, do you want to get trained? Minimum wage, I'm telling you, but it's worth it. Because I was getting something, I was learning something I had no idea about. So whether it would be writing papers for them, whether it was just doing simple assessments on patients, or whether it was just observing or tagging along with them and doing blood draws, it was just something to add to it. And when you prove your worth over time, I think I spent about eight months. Then I started seriously applying for jobs everywhere else, networking with people. And that's when it eventually that I moved into pediatric neurology. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And just some things that you talked, you talked about that I want to highlight in, in what, what you share. So there is another misconception in the IMG community mm -hmm. that the IMG has to be the first author that publishes the article in, yes. you know, New England Journal for it to qualify for research, right? Yeah. And that is so not true because in the U.S. medical system, you only become the expert after you've obtained residency training if you're talking about mm -hmm. a physical specialty. So the specialty is not expecting you to have all these publications before you come in. They want you to bring your skill set, what you've learned, into mm -hmm. um, your residency training, and then they're going to use that to develop you into becoming the first author and malt and more. Now, if you already have that and you're already, you, you know, someone that's maybe an MD, PhD, or you have a prior science degree and you've already been participating in research, that's fine. That's great. Mm -hmm. But it's not a requirement that you become the first author on a randomized controlled trial to be considered competitive. Um, Absolutely. Just kind, of, just kind of pointing that out. So someone's asking, do you need any certification to do anything in the U.S.? Did you need ECFMG certification to do this research? No, I didn't. No. That, no, because the position for research, a lot of people from different fields join in. Most of them should at least have bachelor's and about a year or two worth of experience. With you having an MBBS degree, it means that you have a graduate level degree. So sometimes some places you can apply if you have a working visa that you can apply and they would take you on minimum experience because they believe that the medical knowledge that you would have would easily translate and you would be able to learn pretty quickly. Yeah. Otherwise, um, I don't think that you can get a paid research job on visas that don't allow you a, with work. a work permit. Yeah. 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 Because obviously that's outside of the scope of the facility you must Absolutely. have a, a, a work visa or a work permit or some kind of status that allows you to work in order to mm -hmm. get any of these positions legally in the country. Absolutely, um, yeah. Yeah, so what I did, mine wasn't a paid, when I was a student, mm -hmm. it wasn't a paid position. I was on a B, B1, B2 visa. Mm -hmm. So I could see somebody, some people in the comments are talking about the B, B1, B2 visa. And I was on a B1, B2 visa and I did participate in research, but... I was not paid. Yes. I was a volunteer. Um, 
but it was good for me because for me it was all about getting the the experience it was mm -hmm. me about getting the the qualification to say she did research and here here's what it was and ours was something we were doing the fecal, fecal immunochemical testing for colon cancer and so it was something that I, I, I was interested in, you know, mm -hmm. just in general, general medicine, colon cancer affects most people. And so it was just a volunteer position. And I was doing data entry, talking to patients, getting people registered, teaching them how to use the devices, taking all their information, following up with them that they actually completed their test and submitted them back to us for us to run them. So there were just several steps to that. And so I could claim it as a research facilitator. Role. Yes. But it was... Obviously, I was a volunteer. Now, you can, if you're on a B1, B2, then yes, you may want to look at, if you're in the States, you want to look at a, a volunteer position within a research project. So Absolutely. just some tips, because the title of this session was how to find research positions. Mm -hmm. For those that are in the States, it's some things that you can do. One, you can look up all the universities in your area, just like Dr. Hood Khan said, she kind of looked in her zip code and was like, what's next door? You can call them or present yourself at your own risk, obviously. Um, and then you can definitely look out for like look up look up like their science departments because that's really where you may find any yes. kind of um, you know biological or, or like chemical research or anything in the biochemistry mm -hmm. like any kind of like cancer research you know those types of things you find them within the, the the like the department of research if they have one or yeah some science related department. Um, and it's really about going down the rabbit hole and looking up these things on the internet because most of yeah. them are not just flashy. You know, I've never seen a researcher. I was like, oh, I'm no, you know, they're no. just there. They just exist. And yeah. you just have to kind of reach out and say, hey, you know, you're looking for a volunteer. Um, I'm looking, I have interest in whatever you're researching and yeah, I would like to help. Um, in some places you may find a listing for a job, you know, and they'll have sure. their, yeah. Um, and then, you, you know, you'll have your, your qualifications on there that you can put. Now, the second way you can do it, obviously, is by going through programs, university programs, and even yeah. um, clinical residency programs that have a designated research position. And they're there. They're out there. There's actually like a transition year program, I think, for IMGs. I've, I've seen that in Pennsylvania. Um, I don't remember the exact name of the program, but they have like a one-year program where IMGs can come in and get like oriented into the u.s system or whatever yes. you know there are several programs like that that exist okay mm -hmm. so you can also look into that the third thing they're also um obviously as we all know there are paid opportunities to be an observer which can open up a door for you to eventually meet yes. a researcher so that's another way the fourth way is speaking to your alumni so if you have alumni in your school your friends like people that have done it you ask them how did you do it how did you find yours Mine, as a student, when I was here on a B1, B2, the way I found it was by just word of mouth, talking to yes. somebody that knew somebody that knew somebody. So yeah. I talked to another student who had done some kind of similar project. I was in Chicago at the time. The Cook County Hospital is a big hospital. Mm -hmm. They have a lot going on. I was on their website looking, knocking on doors, and then I just literally stumbled upon it one day while I was doing a rotation. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times, you know, just talking to people is one way. If you have mentors, ask them. Ask them Absolutely. for direction, ask them what to do, where to go. Even if you're located outside of the States, you can start where you're planted. Your research doesn't yeah. have to be in the United States. No, and that's the best thing. That is, I think, absolutely the best thing. I think for medical students who are already in their schools, try to use your resources within your school, your professors and everyone. If you show your interest, if you're putting yourself out there, they're bound to, you might get like no's, eight no's, but all you need is one yes. So that's there. But if you are already a graduate and you're coming here and you're giving your steps and you want to make sure that you're able to get it, I think the best way is, like you mentioned, like you have to really go down that ra rabbit hole and try to find it. And I think a lot of people will feel disheartened about it. But trust me, with research, it's all about getting your foot in the door. Once you get that foot in the door, it just becomes a lot easier knowing more people and knowing what is the best best thing for you to do in the limited time that you have yeah so if yeah. you're located someone's asking if canadian research yes it would count because yes you have to understand that you have to understand something guys this is not about you faking to be somebody that you're not when it comes to residency application it's about being who you are 
And if mm -hmm. you are interested in general surgery, you should be interested in general surgery in Canada or in Cameroon or in Saudi or in China. It should be the same. Yes. And so by virtue of that, you should be able to prove to me that you have done clinical work that proves your interest in general surgery. You want to advance a specialty. And maybe you've participated by shadowing a surgeon or mm -hmm. writing a case report on a rare disease that you found or, you know, something that aligns with that particular specialty. So I yes. think sometimes in this whole rat race of trying to get into residency, we lose our virtues. We lose our sense of like reality. Mm -hmm. like you don't have to come to the States and be in a randomized controlled trial and be the first author for your research. To no, absolutely not. Start yeah. small, show yeah. interest, show initiative. That's all they need. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And and you can, and you don't have to be the first, the leader. You could be the assistant. You can be the mm -hmm. facilitator, <laughs> and you still get, you know, you still get credit for doing the work. Because again, yeah. the most important thing is learning the tenets of research in that specialty, and then developing that over the course of your career through residency and even afterwards. Yeah. Um, so if you, whatever country you're in right now, you can start where you are and work with your preceptors, work with your attendings and start getting publications if you can, or even presentations, posters, um, reports, case reports, you can get those done wherever you're at. You don't have to wait until you get a job that pays you in dollars in the States, like maybe Dr. Kulikhan got in order to be considered like, oh, now you have research. Um, yes. Yeah, someone's asking how to balance um, all of that with rotations working and being an IMG that has bills and responsibilities. <laughs> so that's basically that? me. <laughs> that's all of me. I, I think like, I just, I'm glad like we're able to talk about this a, even more because I wanted to actually point out that just like you had mentioned earlier, that different um, the specialties have different requirements. So some are research heavy, some are not. So for example, if you even target specific, as long as you're able to write a paper or you're able to get some sort of research opportunity, whether it's doing a paper or assessments or anything, they still count as under research, as research assistant, as research coordination. It still counts within that. It's all about including whatever you do in your CV and making sure that other um, people who, are, who will be viewing your CV can actually see that as well. And some of the specialties are more open to getting people and other ones are highly specific. Uh, aiming for hematology and oncology, they need experience. So they usually try to shut down anyone with minimum experience. That's uh, whether you're writing papers, whether you want to coordinate trials, or you want to get into research. Because for oncology, it's highly competitive. So they usually prefer having people with about five years of experience. So I would suggest everyone to really aim for internal medicine because it's research. There is tons of research that is done, but there's also tons of doctors that are want to get published. Uh, pediatric neurology is up and up upcoming because I'm there personally as well. There are a lot of doctors that are getting slowly getting involved in research. So feel free to try that over there as well. Adult neurology is very research heavy. So if anyone is trying to go towards adult neurology or just wants to get some sort of, or they're out of hope, try to get into adult neurology as well. You never know. Maybe you might meet someone. You, you might want to look into that specialty. And even if not, at the end of the day, you get an experience. They're not, I don't believe that the doctors out there who are trying to get you as a resident will be focusing so much on, but you didn't do research in pediatric neurology. That's not their concern. What they're really focusing on is that you really tried as an international medical graduate to get into the system and do your best wherever you could. And it's all about presenting it. I was presented with an opportunity and I took it and I learned from it. So yeah. I, I just would like to say that just because you're going to neurology, don't just focus on neurology. Try to look in all opportunities everywhere. And like look into all specialties. So my top three recommendations for the, and you can say facilities that are more open to uh, letting students in will be internal medicine. It would be adult neurology and cardiology. So these three, they would definitely 
are constantly, a lot of uh, private doctors are also heavily involved in research. So they would really appreciate having kids coming in and be like, hey, can we help you? Can we write this for yeah. you? Yeah, and yeah. make sure that you actually tell that. Try to have that conversation with the doctors. Be like, oh, I have worked on this. This is what I'm interested in. Do you think there are any interested cases that you have noticed and I can write on them? They can be the first author if they need. That's fine because they will teach you how to write the case reports and the review articles or whatever it is. All you need is that little name and that paper, and then you can just build up on it. Yeah, absolutely. So we have some questions. They're asking if the research needs to be in English. So obviously, Mm -hmm. your ERAS application is in English. So you're going to quote the, the, you're going to cite the article in English. Um, The research paper itself can be in whatever language that you write it in, but you, you, your citation is definitely going to have an English translation. Yes. Um, Someone's asking if it's tough to get into research position. We just laid out all the ways to get research so you can Mm -hmm. go back and watch this video it's going to stay on my profile um you can watch it and get more tips um someone's asking how to improve manuscript how do you improve your manuscript can you give any tips on that practice makes perfect (laughs) honestly tons of uh, um, making sure that if you have a subscription to one of the journals like pubmed I think if you're a medical student, if you're interested in research, try to get a subscription to PubMed.gov. That's where mo- majority of the um, any sort of research article, any case report, everything gets published over there. So if you have access to such, you can always go through papers and look at their layout and see how other people have submitted. So you know that when you're publishing to another journal, this is the format that they're following. So yeah. you can just look in that. Yeah. And, you know, I was just thinking about this because people keep asking, how do I get this position? I'll give you an example. I live in Kentucky right now. If I was looking for a research project today, what I'll do is I'll think of the universities that are located in Kentucky. Mm-hmm. And I'll think of the major academic centers that have residencies or at least affiliation with them or that have large um, science departments. And by science, I mean medicine, dentistry, like all the sciences, health sciences. And I will basically go on the website, find a number to contact, and I'll start calling. Mm-hmm. And I'll ask for the department, what research department do you have? What, what do you have ongoing? So for example, that would mean for me, I'll look into University of Kentucky and I'll look into University of Louisville because I know that there must be some kind of research going on in some yeah. department. Yeah. And I'm just going to start calling and asking what's going on, you know, what department can I talk to about research and da da da. And between Google and a bunch of phone calls, you can find out what's being researched at both these universities. And then I'll start emailing everybody I can find on there. Or if I'm courageous, I'll probably go by in person because you see the building, it would say, Susan G. Coleman Center for Research or whatever. You can <laughs> see it right there. Yes. You and can. I'll present myself and I'll say, you know, I'm a doctor from XYZ country. Or I'm a medical student in the Caribbean. I'm in third year. I'm kind of in limbo now with COVID, looking to help. I yes. you, you'll stumble on somebody that is willing to either take you under their wings or show you the ropes or give you some, some to do. So yeah. I think a lot of times we don't find opportunities because we haven't looked and we haven't really put ourselves out there. I absolutely um, agree. So, you know, it always counts. Someone's asking if, if it's beneficial to do research in any field due to COVID. I'll tell you a funny story. So not, it's not funny, actually. It's actually a really good story. Um, last May or, no, last April, May, I um, I did my online course, the Amity Roadmap. It's like a six-week life course. And each Sunday we met in a life group coaching session, kind of like this, but in private. And one of the students wanted research so bad. And I gave him this same scenario and I said, It's the middle of a pandemic right now. We still don't know what we're doing. I Mm -hmm. bet you if you created a case report on anything pandemic related, you'll have somebody wanting to read it. And so he (laughs) took that. It was in his clinical rotations. And he took that and talked to his preceptor doing his rotations, was looking out for cases to present. You know, like we had, that's when we started learning about COVID, like the loss of smell, loss of taste, the neurological Mm -hmm. things that were coming up. So he had one case that ended up with a stroke, which was one of the things we learned was it, COVID causes a lot of um, thrombophilias, like in different ways, you know, either clots, strokes, and PE risk and such. 
And he wrote a paper, which ended up getting published in a, in a journal by, I think it was July or August. Because that was something that was just like, everybody was hot for that information. Like we mm-hmm. wanted all the, the, any paper, any you could get on COVID, case report, case series, anything. And he sent that to me by email. I was like, wow, thanks for just giving us the idea of thinking outside the box. And so sometimes you can create your own opportunity. He could have waited for somebody to come in and tell him, this is my research and here's what to do. Or he could ask his preceptor like he did and say, can I present on this case? Can I write a case series on it? Are you going to review it? And can we submit it to a few journals and see if they'll want to have my case report published? And so sometimes you have to be innovative. You have to put yourself out there and try. It's just not going to fall in your lap. And just be yeah. not so um, narrow in your, I think it's good to be focused, but just be open to opportunities and seeing like how that opportunity can best serve you. The best thing right now when you're applying for a residency is that you are a student. Nobody is looking at you just as a professional. They're trying to see you now and the potential you have. So if you're as a student, you need to showcase different strengths that you have. So just being like, oh, I don't have research and I can't do this, whether it be your extracurriculars, it would be your leadership skills, whether it be your volunteer work, whether it's your research or thinking outside of the box and finding creative solutions, that sets you apart from people. And those are the kind of doctors that we need to see in our facility. COVID happened. It was a nightmare. And it was up till now, our department has been, has been scrambling around, making sure everything is perfect. We have different kinds of situations depending on every uh, department. Like, it's, it's a mess. But we have certain people, whether it's doctors or nurses, people like you who have creative solutions that helped us overcome this and come on the brighter end of it. So I just want, like, I know as IMG students, we get so overwhelmed about whether we're doctors or not, whether we're good enough or not, we're competing with the American students, are we going to make it or not? There's so many self-doubt and questions. I just want to make sure that highlight your strengths. Highlight what sets you apart. Highlight what makes you a good candidate. And whether it be through research, whether through the extra cookers, it's just about how you present yourself. So I really believe in that. Yeah, yeah, I agree 100%. And when I listen to you talk, I'm like, wow, you know, she's going to, she's going to do really well and she's going to make it far because I, I, hope wish more so. people, <laughs> I wish more people had the mindset that you had, because sometimes there's a rush to just check a box that we're not even mm-hmm. doing good quality work. Like mm-hmm. we just want to check a box. Like, you know, can I just check this box? But that's not the point. Okay. Yeah. There, There's not a point to, to just like, you know, go ahead and just like try to check a box every time. Like you need mm-hmm. to sometimes do things diligently. Okay. You need to sometimes yeah. take your time and do the work. And this is going to answer someone's question. It says, can you do part-time research in order to prepare for you as an exam? You could participate in research while preparing for an exam. There's no reason why you can't. You can't do yeah. that. Because it's not supposed to be a full-time where you're doing like 12 hours every day, seven days no. a week. You can, you can work on a schedule that works for you. You can mm-hmm. say, I'm going to do one day a week or two days a week where I dedicate my time to my research. And then six days, five days, I'm studying. That's plenty of time to study, right? Oh, yeah. Set your yeah. deadlines. And yeah, do that. and do it and do it. And right. also one thing that's very important for everyone to know, no matter what part of the world you're in, if you find that there's a group of students that are interested in research and that you feel like we know how to write papers or case reports or whatever, when you're going on your rotations, wherever you might be, why don't you all three get together and actually start practicing and working on manuscripts and talk to a trusted professor That way you have a group of people where you can discuss ideas and it's just, you also have three different peoples working towards the same goals. You're just maximizing your resources. So if you have, you have three people working on one project and you approach three different professors, you just have a higher likelihood of getting better information and making sure that you're applying to the right kind of journals, that you're not missing out on anything and that you're utilizing your resources to the best of your potential. Use your university, use your peers, use your mentors, and please just tell people what you want. I think you need to go and tell, like, I need help with this. I think a lot of us struggle with that. And that was something I needed to learn and be like, listen, I'm lost. 
I need to prove myself. I am capable of love. Just use me in whatever way possible. And before I knew it, I am in research where I feel that I'm very blessed and I have the luxury to be like, I can go into residency. And if I choose to stay in research, I still have a very good future here. So yeah. it's just, you never know what's out there. Yeah. So Wally is who I was talking about. And he just dropped a comment saying that. Was yeah, him. I saw that. <laughs> so I, Wally, can you, in the comment section, can you just tell us how you, how you initiated that process? Because I think, most of the people that reach out to you, um, uh, Wafa, and that also reach out to me about this research question, the problem is initiating contact. Yes. It's like there's that mind block that we don't want to even start. Like, how do yeah. I start? You're thinking so much about how you're going to get rejected and how impossible it is that you can't even be creative to think about, well, I live down the road from University of Tennessee. Let me see what they have, right? Yes. Well, I live down the road from the University of Kentucky. Let me find out if they have opportunity. You know, sometimes it starts by just asking that question. Like, you need to ask an open-ended question and just start digging down that road. And you will find yeah. something. You, won't, you will never find what you're not looking for. Like, you have to be looking for something to find it. And so Absolutely. sometimes I feel like that's the mind block that people mm -hmm. go through is getting over that, like, what if, what if, what if, instead of, like, I'm just going to do it and see what happens, right? Like, you just have you're to You're going to get a no anyways. Yeah. Sitting at home, you're going to get a no. That's a no yeah. already. But what if yeah. you get a yes? What if a doctor's like, uh, let me check with a friend of mine? Or a nurse is like, hey, I'm working on something. Can you help me? Because I'm a full-time, and maybe you can help me two hours a week or something. There you go. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's like, you know like people don't realize if you don't put yourself out there okay so yeah one of the things obviously on instagram i do is like motivating people but mm -hmm. i'm starting to learn like i don't want to motivate people i want people to take action like i mm -hmm. i don't want to sit here and just tell you a nice thing because it doesn't make a difference if you don't take action and so if you're mm -hmm. on this life right now and because life is going to round up soon we were planning for 30 minutes and we're a little bit over time but if you're on this life right oops. Now, yeah, oops. Um, <laughs> you know, this is your cue to take action. This is your mm. cue to start Monday morning and start calling, emailing, looking at programs, spending, instead of spending time on YouTube, on Instagram, go down that rabbit hole and seek out all the research facilities in your area. Present yourself if you may, okay? Do whatever it takes to get you where, what you want yeah. and don't stop until you get what you want be ready for no's because like dr kulikan said you'll be sitting at home and that's equivalent to a no the only difference is you're soothing yourself with the pacifier thinking mm -hmm. that you're not getting a no because you're not trying mm -hmm. so unless you set yourself out there and just just get into the hot oil guys just just get right into just it. jump Start right in jump like and then um, come, yeah just try it, and it's so true. It's funny, actually, you mentioned that because one of the doctors actually pointed out to me, like, when because I work for clinical trials, one of my job is that I help other doctors make sure that, okay, you need to sign. So for a study startup, I have to get a bunch of paperwork signed by doctors. And sometimes they have busy schedules. I can't expect them to just be available for me 24-7. They're at a different clinic. And then I have my doctor's schedule. And I had the stack of my papers and I texted him and I was like I'm showing up at your clinic in five minutes and he's like are you serious and he's sitting over there he has like a five minute break I'm like sign these now and he's like you're a very persistent little lady I was like I'm helping you I was yeah. like, I'm just making sure that when this d hits the deadline and I yeah at I know it was a bit of a risk but at the same time, I'm glad that I did that because now that doctor has been helping me in ways and like teaching me things that I feel like I would have never gotten a chance to learn if I was just aiming for a residency program. So yeah. I was just, I just feel like for me, the minute that I took that bridge or that um, barrier out of my head, that the only way that I can be a doctor or the only way that I can learn is through residency. I just found myself in a room with so much opportunities that I can do this, I can do that. And I think that's what a lot of us IMGs and medical students just need. Mm -hmm. and, we need the alternatives. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, something I admire about your process is you, you are being diligent. 
um, in pursuing what you want in the sense that you, you don't stop, you hear these no's and you keep going. But the key thing is I don't perceive when I speak with you that anxiety of I need to have it and I need to have it now. And I think that's what's, unfortunately negatively affecting a lot of IMGs Mm -hmm. because what we don't understand is for example last year there were 30,000 or a little like he did 30 to 33,000 positions in the match all specialties so say for example each year there's always more applicants than their position so there's just no way everybody's going to match the same time the same cycle some of us are going to match. It's just going to be the next cycle or the next cycle or the next cycle, just by virtue of the numbers. And that unnecessary pressure I see IMGs put on themselves causes a lot of anxiety and doesn't help them achieve results because they're in a rush to take exams. They're in a rush to do the next thing, in a rush, in a rush, in a rush. And I admire your diligence because I feel like with your, you're doing it steadily, like you still have that desire, but you're doing it steadily, but you're also creating yourself a plan B. Mm -hmm. which can obviously serve you in multiple ways, whether it's as a resident researcher, a physician researcher, or even as a full-blown researcher down the road. So I I really admire that. Sometimes doing things fast and doing it now is not always the right answer. Mm -hmm. Sometimes taking your time and actually working on your research for a year or two years may actually make you more competitive down the road if you're in the right space right absolutely because there's no way that you would not be appealing to a child neurology program after spending this much time in child neurology research for example yes um so i just wanted to tell you that um that i I find that particularly admirable and i can't even believe like i'm talking to you right now because i'm pretty sure that i have gone through all of your posts all of your podcasts because i think (laughs) it's so important to hear someone who you can relate to and yeah. like you always have that, you not only tell us, oh, I'm going here to motivate you, you just hit us with the facts. Yes, you're going to be anxious. Yes, you're going to lose your mind, but this is how you get it. And that's the kind mm-hmm. of person that I am. I was like, I know I'm going to lose my mind. I am best friends with my anxiety, okay? Now tell me what I need to do about it. Like I need a solution to it. So I'm just like so grateful for you taking the opportunity to just talk to me that and giving me that reassurance, I'm doing something right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because yeah. it's think helpful, you are. yeah. I think you are. And so yeah. Wally just dropped in the comments what he did to get his publication. So he says, I did, a, and this is him speaking, I did a review on a ton of papers and wrote the article oh. in many journals with accelerating publications on COVID and waiving any mm-hmm. fees. So I sent it to one. Um, after that, I was able to get bench research done at Columbia, which got published too, because they were impressed about the paper that opened doors. So again, this is a clear mm-hmm. cut of, you know, this is a, a clear cut example of Wale, who is one of the students in my Andrew mm-hmm. Map course, but he start, you just start with something and you just do it. And then it yes. opens up another door and then he gets another research out of Columbia, which is a pretty good name because yes. some of us are always seeking names, but beyond that, we're seeking names because those names are easily recognized by programs. So it's not Absolutely. wrong to seek names. It's not wrong. But, you know, for those of you that always think, how do I get to publish at Columbia? Well, he started out by doing something at home, a, a collection of articles and doing a review of that. And then that offers the next opportunity to the big name that people are seeking out. So sometimes you just have to start. Like, I think yes. that's the biggest thing. Just start where you're planning. Grow where you're planning. Just planet, start it. Going to work. Yes, you just start where you're at. And so if you Kate get a says, no, then move on. Yes, Fine. move on. No, Kate says she's another. got a lot of no's. She says, I've got so many no's because they're worried about social distancing and not taking people on. Keep trying. Keep yes. trying. All you need is one yes. Keep trying. And if um, they say that, oh, you can't come in, just say that's completely okay. Can I schedule us for a Zoom call every one or two weeks? You see, you're giving them a solution. You're giving them an idea. Can I schedule a call every one or two weeks so we can discuss on what I need to do and what are my expectations and the deadline? So the person's yeah. like, oh, really? I get a pub- someone working on my papers already and gets all my work done, and all I have to do is give them 15 minutes for two weeks? Yeah, remember, there you go. When, when you go in as a research assistant or facilitator, you're helping the people. Yes. You're making somebody's life easier. So you're yes. an asset. You're not a liability. You're an asset. Mm-hmm. Um, so don't forget that. Uh, Kendris is asking, as a current first year, when would – be the best time to get involved you can get involved now you can start now anytime is yeah there's no perfect time 
Um, but you don't want to let it consume all your time. You can do very mm-hmm. little. You can do basic science research. It doesn't have to be great. Just do a little yeah. thing. And before we even go talking about research, before I leave, if you're a medical student and you're in a Caribbean school and you're third and fourth year, you should be presenting a poster during your rotations. You should be presenting um, oral presentations because those also go in your ERAS application. You should be looking for, um, and, and like I mentioned, post this year this year in 2021 there's still going to be conferences so there's still going to be conferences for most specialty societies mm-hmm. some of them are virtual most of them are virtual most you can of them, still yes. present yeah you can still present at a virtual conference and you still count telemedicine is big now telemedicine oh, yes. is growing fast you can be that pioneer do what Wally did gather up a, a couple of telemedicine articles and evaluate the difference between telemedicine in 2020 Mm-hmm. And telemedicine in the year 2000. What has changed? Okay. And that's something you can submit to Medscape. You can submit to whatever uh, journal that you have the most access to. And tell me that they reject it if it's a well written article. So, and that it may, that, that may not be peer reviewed publication, mm-hmm. but it would still be a research, it would still fall under posters and presentations on your ERAS application, which shows your mm. interest in the clinical specialty because that's the most important thing. Yeah. Yeah. Most definitely. Well, thank you guys so much for joining. Uh, time's up. If you have any questions, leave them in the comment. Share this live. It'll stay on my profile. So share it with your friends, your families, other IMGs. My goal this year, last year I had a goal to help 1,000 IMGs. I, I think I well exceeded that. But my goal this year is to be upfront and bring you guys, uh, there's, you know, I'm not hiding anything anymore. Like I'm bringing you guys the information straight from my house to you. Um, I really want to see more and more and more IMG succeed. So thank you for joining me, Dr. Kulikhan. I really appreciate you taking your time out to come on tonight. I know it's your week off. You could be doing so many things, but (laughs) I appreciate your time. And I I have a very good feeling about your, your uh, future and, and your roadmap. Yeah. I think you've created a path for yourself that I've never really met another IMG in that space and, and who has embraced it like you have. And I know that it's going to work out for you. Thank you so much for having me. This has been like therapy for me. I'm sorry if I was like reading through it. I've never done, but I just feel a little less cluttered. But I, I know the pain everyone is going through and it just gets better. It's just, it definitely gets better. Yeah, I'm just going to leave a word for Toyo C because she sent me that message. I I saw your email. She sent me an email recently. Another thing you can do uh, for those that are in rotations right now, if you're in a rotation, say, for example, you're doing an OBGYN rotation and you're interested in OB, don't leave that rotation until you've done like at least one or two oral presentations, until you've identified one case that you can write a report on, until you've connected with that preceptor and asked them if you can even publish in in their um, journal or whatever or whatever links that they have for that community but you want to make sure that you have your preceptor liking you obviously there are ways to do that be just being a nice person but then also facilitating your life in whatever way but that's a whole different topic for another day it's yes. hard to really <laughs> maximize your rotation but i just saw her name and i remember an email that she sent to me but thanks so much thanks for joining thank you dr all right bye all right bye bye, all right. bye. 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 I don't know how to end it. <laughs> it's the it's the X of the, the X. Topic. Okay. <laughs>